Well, where do we start? Well, we start off, before I say what Marxism is, or try to do so, we better say what Marxism is not. My first advice to you, as someone that once used to attend one of these temples of learning many years ago, is you can forget about everything that you've read about Marxism. Just forget it. If you want to know what Marxism is, then my advice to you is don't read books about Marxism, what Marx really said, but take the trouble to read the works of Marx himself. Now, uh, I'm aware of the fact that that's, uh, that advice is not exactly fashionable. The fashionable thing, which you will doubtless hear repeated many times in your seminars and lectures, is, well, Marxism is uh, old fascist, old hat. Why bother with ancient ideas 150 years ago? In fact, I remember when I was a student, the then leader of the Labour Party, a man called Harold Wilson, said the following, that we must not seek solutions in Highgate Cemetery. Uh, In case you don't know, that's where Marx's mortal remains are interred. Now, funnily enough, I happen to agree with Mr. Wilson. You will not find anything in Highgate Cemetery except for a bunch of old bones, dusty remains, and a rather ugly monument. Okay? But what we're talking about here is not mortal remains. What we're talking about here are ideas. Now, here's a funny thing. Here's a very strange thing. 150 years later, the ruling class, the representatives of the present order of of the world, spend an inordinate amount of time and money and effort trying to prove that Marxism is dead. You know? Now, you see, I can believe many things about the ruling class, but there's one thing I do not believe for a moment. I do not believe that they are stupid. And I do not believe for one moment that the ruling class would spend so much time, so much money, and so much effort attacking an idea that is dead. Rather, I'm inclined to believe that the ruling class will only attack an idea that's not only very much alive but which is positively dangerous to them and the system which they represent. Now, in the short time at my disposal, it's materially impossible to really answer the question, what is Marxism? But I will try to do my best to point out certain aspects, anyway, of these brilliant ideas. Yes, they are brilliant ideas. Let me just start with a little test, with your permission. You know, I take it that in this... uh, uh, marvellous temple of learning, there is such a thing as a library. Do you possess a library in these days? I know you all read computers and stuff like that. You don't (laughs) pretend to understand. Is there a library here? Yay or nay? More than one. More than one. Is it a good library? Well, okay, it's not bad. (laughs) That's sensible. (coughs) Okay, so tomorrow morning, first thing, after listening to this discussion... Please go to this library. I'll issue a challenge to you. You pick out any bourgeois book, any orthodox establishment book about economics or philosophy or uh, sociology or politics written 150 years ago, and I will tell you in advance that that book will merely have an historical interest. Practical application to the 21st century, zero or close to zero. Now here's another challenge. You pick up the Communist Manifesto written by Marx and Engels in 1847-1848 and you'll have a surprise. If you haven't read it, you'll have a surprise. If you have read it, read it again, please. I've read it hundreds of times and every time I pick up that book I learn something new. Here is a book written 150 years ago, more than 150 years ago, which describes and analyzes the world, not the world of 1848, not at all. Not at all. It describes and analyzes the world of now. 
the present world in which we live, and explains phenomena which none of the smart gentlemen with the letters after their names in this university or any other can explain. In terms of, uh, let me give you two examples. Globalization is supposed to be a new thing. It's not a new thing, not at all. Globalization was predicted by Marx and Engels and explained in the Communist Manifesto in 1848 when it did not exist. No, no, no evidence of it. The concentration of capital. Ah, that's an argument that the economists in particular and the sociologists strenuously denied. When I was a student, oh, they, how they had a good laugh at Marx, you know. What do you mean, the, the concentration of capital? By which he meant an enormous concentration of power and wealth in a few hands, on the one hand, and on the other extreme, an accumulation of poverty, misery, and degradation. What nonsense! This, oh, how they laughed! At, we're all middle class now. Did you know that? We're all middle class now. This is the, they still repeat this guff, this nonsense. Uh, the, the economists even put forward a, a, a slogan a few years, ago, a few decades ago. Anyway, small is beautiful. Perhaps you heard that. By which they meant not aesthetics, but um, small enterprises were the future. Not so, my friends. Not so. The con there's never been in history an, a, 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 such a colossal concentration of power in a, and, and wealth in a few hands than exists at the present time. In the States, the Occupy movement, they put forward a marvellous slogan. I wish I'd thought of it. I wasn't smart enough. We are the 99%. 1% control the economy. Of the I'm speaking from, I think it's 65 individuals have more wealth in their hands than half of the human race, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly. An obscene concentration of power and wealth on the one hand, and on the other hand a growing army of unemployed, of people who are desperate, miserable, on a, on a poverty-stricken, dying of Ebola, seven or eight million children die every year of the, of the lack of, for the lack of, of clean drinking water. Now, I would defy anybody you see in this room to look at the facts of the world in which we live and seriously to say, no, capitalism works. Everything is fine and dandy, as the Tories would have us to believe. Well, not so. But, you see, Marxism challenges this. And what, what I'm saying to you is, first of all, what I'm pointing out to you is the, is the power of ideas. Marxism, to begin with, is a very powerful analytical tool. I would go so far as to say that without a thorough knowledge of Marxism and the method of Marxism, it is impossible really to understand what is occurring on a world scale in the, the first part of the 21st century. Most people, they turn on the television screens and they despair. It seems that the whole world has gone mad. Well, there is a madness, of course there's a madness, but the madness is called capitalism in its phase of decline, which Marx explained. But to what I was about to say, Marxism... Actually, there are three fundamental elements of Marxism. There's a, a, a well-known book by Lenin, which I can recommend, called The Three Sources and the Three Component Parts of Marxism, which deals with this, which uh, you might like to have a look at that. Marxism has got three elements. First of all, the first, and in my opinion, the most fundamental element is not politics, although, although I was very delighted to see that this meeting began not with a discussion of student affairs, but with a worker, a trade unionist, explaining to the students the need for the struggle for the advance of the working class against the bosses in order to defend and develop their, their, defend their living standards against the constant attacks which are taking place. And the need for students and workers to unite in... Yes, I apologise if I offend anyone's uh, sensibility. The class struggle. Because, yes, the class struggle is alive and well, as you'll see in the next few weeks with the strikes and demonstrations that will take place in Britain. Never mind about on, on a world scale. But you see, Marxism is, is more than that. Marxism isn't just politics. It covers a vast scope, a vast array of uh, subjects. And actually, Marxism began as a philosophy Although Marx himself, the young Marx, pointed out a very important... Uh, any philosophers here? Anyone studying philosophy? Raise your hands. No, nobody will admit to it. Oh, there. 
Economist. <laughs> I won't ask how many economists you got. They did a bit even less. Uh, philosoph- Marx did say, philosophers have only interpreted the world in different ways. The point is, however, to change it. Never forget that. We don't have these discussions just to have an entertaining uh, couple of hours. It's not an entertainment at all. It's a tool, and, a, and a, it's a revolutionary tool, a way, first of all, in order to change the world, one has to understand it. Marx and Engels started out as philosophers. As philosophers. So the first part is Marxist philosophy, which is known as dialectical materialism. I'll say a bit about the There will be a case for having a special session on Marxist philosophy, incidentally. The second part is the application of that method to history. That's to say, to our own evolution. To our own history, our own, deve- our own social development, which is called historical materialism. And the third element, which I believe you dealt with at the last meeting, so I won't spend too much time on that, is Marxist economics, or the labor theory of, uh, of value. I, was, I said that I'm, I'm going to say what Marxism is not. They, they talk such a lot of nonsense. I just sometimes tear my hair when I hear the, the, the stuff that they talk about. Oh, yes, Marx, he was the man that reduced everything to economics. You heard that? Marxism reduced everything to economics. What a load of absolute nonsense. How is it possible to reduce everything to economics? It's not possible. Religion, politics, philosophy, psychology, all these things, morality, it all plays a role, a colossal role in human doing. You can't reduce everything. That's just absolute nonsense. What Marx did say, and that is absolutely true, and I defy anyone to, to, to say the contrary, is this. That the viability of any given socio-economic system will depend in the last analysis on its ability to develop the productive forces, to develop industry, agriculture, to provide people with jobs, food, clothing on their backs, housing, and so on and so forth. A society that can provide these things is likely to, to survive. A society which cannot provide these things will not survive, will enter into crisis which is precisely the situation that now exists. It wasn't the case in Marx's day. Marx's day, capitalism performed, as he says in the manifesto, an enormous progressive role in developing industry and developing the productive forces. That's why they were so confident. That's why liberalism thrived, you know, with this idea, today better than yesterday, tomorrow better than today, future's going to be marvellous, the sky's the limit. Where's that now? Where are those liberal ideas today? They don't exist. On the contrary, the ruling class is seized, and its ideologists are seized, seized with an attack of pessimism, of despair, of negativity. They don't see any future. They have no solutions, it's a fact. They have no solutions whatsoever to the crisis which grips the world, and which affects every person, by the way, in this, in this room. Anyway, to go back to philosophy... You know, sometimes when I talk about Marxist philosophy, people look at me, even experienced uh, communists in the labor movement, they say, well, well, what's this about philosophy? I I don't need philosophy. What's what's that going to do with the classroom? What's that going to do with anything? Well, you know, here's a funny thing, you know. Um, Everybody has a philosophy. There's nobody in the world that doesn't have a philosophy. And the man or woman that says to me, well, I don't have a philosophy, all that is telling me is that this person, this man or woman, will merely repeat like a parrot the ideas, the politics, the religion, the morality, the values, which surround them from the moment they are born till the moment that they die. Okay? Now, if you are happy with this society, if it strikes you as being all perfectly okay, if you agree with its morality, its values, its religion, its politics, and so on, then I have nothing further to say to you. You may leave. If, however, like myself, you don't agree with this system, you think there's something fundamentally wrong with it, and that it needs to be changed, then, of course, i will say this to you. You need a philosophy. You need a different philo- a way of looking at the world. Okay. You need a revolutionary philosophy. And the only revolutionary philosophy of which I am aware 
is precisely the philosophy of Marxism, dialectical materialism. Now, people get a bit frightened of this. Marxism, of course, is a science. There are sciences and sciences. It's not an exact science. But then other sciences also are not exact science. Medicine is not an exact science. Geology, even, is not an exact science. But these are sciences. And like all sciences, it has its own terminology, which is somewhat different from the terminology of everyday life. But let's try to explain this. You, you notice there's two halves to this, dialectics and materialism. What's dialectics to begin? Well, dialectics was not invented by Marx. It is a very ancient idea, as a matter of fact. The first thing that I have to say to you is that Mar the Marxist philosophy is a dynamic view of things. It's based on the idea that everything, without exception, is in a constant process of change, of flux, this is an old idea. Marx derived that idea from Hegel, the great German philosopher. And even further back, you can say, it right back to the Greeks. What marvelous, what marvelous philosophy the Greeks had, eh? eh? Symphony? Yeah, I hope so. Marvelous. Astonishing to think about what these guys achieved. Just with the force of their brains, without any technology, equipment, without, just imagine, without computers, without Facebook. Without Twitter, how could they, they say, without mobile phones, without even a telescope. But they, 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 they made marvellous. You know, uh, uh, Anax Anaximander, I think it was, yes, mm -hmm. predicted this, uh, thousands of years before Darwin that man developed from a fish. And he proved it by, by comparing human embryos and fossils. Marvellous. They knew that the, 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 the earth was round, and they even measured its circumference quite accurately. They even developed the theory, theory of, of atomism. Karl Marx did his doctoral thesis on the uh, Greek atomist, on Democritus and uh, Leo Kippus. Astonishing. Astonishing. And one of the great Greek thinkers was before Socrates, pre-Socratic philosopher. All of them were materialists, by the way. I'll come to materialism in a minute. By the name of Heraclitus. His contemporaries thought that he was so difficult to understand that he referred to him as Heraclitus the Dark. And Heraclitus developed a series of ideas. He said, for example, it is imp we step and do not step into the same stream. No man steps into the same stream twice because it flows. And well, that's what he said. This is the, the most brilliant idea. He said, everything is and is not because everything is in flux. Everything is fluid. Well, that's a staggering idea. It's a staggering and a profoundly true idea. But it flies in the face of what you might call common sense. What do you mean? Everything is fluid. Everything is not fluid. I'm not fluid. Look at this table. It's solid. Look at the... the you know, there's an English proverb. As solid as the ground under my feet. You heard that? As solid as the ground under my feet. Yes, but the only one's problem with that. You see, the ground under our feet is not solid, not at all. Not at all. The continents are moving. India was an island that crashed into, into, uh, into the uh, Asian continent and is, is driving up even to this day. It's driving up the, uh, the Himalayas. And beneath the surface, this is an important, uh, I'll draw an analogy at the moment, beneath the, the apparently still tranquil surface this hard surface of rock and earth, there are, there are tremendous seething forces of unimaginable temperatures and pressures, of molten rock, okay, which is striving to find a way out of the, of, of the earth's surface. And it will find a way out sooner or later. It will. It will find a, a weak point in the earth's surface. We even know where the weak points are. We know, for example, the city of San Francisco is condemned. It will be destroyed by a, 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 an enormous earthquake. Don't know when. That's why I say geology is not a precise science. You can't predict. How can you conduct experiments in geology? You cannot. But nevertheless, it's a fact that it will be destroyed. And that, by the way, there's an, an analogy with society. But let's, let's go back. I'll come back to the earthquakes in a moment. But you <coughs> see, the idea that everything is constantly changing, nothing is static flies in the face of human 
human, the human brain. Now, I, I don't, of course, I, I've not met most of you before and never uh, met your parents. But I'm fairly sure, you see, that if you go back after this meeting, you go back in, at half term and you go to your parents and you say, oh, by the way, I've become a Marxist and I want to carry out the revolution and change the world. To, I'm just imagining the type of conversation that would ensue, always assuming they didn't throw you out uh, immediately. <laughs> Probably because parents are smart, and probably they'd say something like this. Oh, no, no, don't do that, don't do that, don't be silly, don't be stupid. Don't throw your life away. You see, I, when I was your age, you know that? When I was your age, I used to think like that. But I've got older and wiser, and I've learned that it's impossible. It's impossible. It's utopia. Because you can't change human nature. Human nature has always been the same. People have always been selfish. Can't change it. Yes. Yes, does that strike a bell? By the way, let me give you a little bit of advice. It is not true that people become older and wiser. Many people become older and more stupid. Okay, bear that in mind. Next time you get a telling off. <laughs> now, let's, the human nature doesn't change. It's always the same. It's always been the same. Absolute nonsense. So-called human nature actually has changed many times in the course of millions of years, and it still changes. It's still changing. And people's psychology, people's outlook, and so on and so forth. Let me give you a couple of uh, examples. If, you were, if I were to ask you, what is the most abhorrent, the most uh, inhuman phenomenon that, that you could imagine, I would guess that cannibalism would be fairly high up on the list, wouldn't it be? Yes. Let me, I, I've got news for you. In the past, your great, 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 great grandmother and grandmother and mine were cannibals. Cannibalism existed in all the human societies, as a matter of fact. And I'm just imagining, you know, because protein was very... I don't want to offend the vegetarians among you, you know, I know some of my best friends are vegetarians, and they inform me that it is possible to exist without meat. You know, you can have nuts and whole meat stuff, stuff they sell in the health shops, and perfectly all right. Now, I'm prepared to believe this. You know, I'm not a vegetarian myself. I'm quite prepared to believe it. There's only one little snag, you see, with this. Three million years ago, approximately, when our species started to evolve, in the savannas of eastern Africa, there were not many health shops open you see and therefore our ancestors with little creatures this high would eat anything usually they, were, they weren't smart enough to hunt they couldn't hunt usually they had dead bodies of uh, decaying animals the flint tools were very useful not to kill or hunt animals couldn't do that but to crack open old bones and extract the marrow very important for the development of the brain by the way but it's a separate discussion now, to back, back to human nature. I'm just imagining, you know, a conclave of cannibals. Yeah, meeting, a tribal meeting, which the tribe used to meet together very democratically. And some guy, some eccentric young chap jumps up, someone like you, and says, hang on a sec, I don't really think we should eat uh, people, you know. Somehow it doesn't seem right. Just imagine the storm of indignation. What do you mean you can't eat people? You know? We've always eaten people. It's in our religion to eat people. It's human nature to eat people. And you can't change human nature. You know. <laughs> now, there is a film, used to be a TV series years ago, called The Flintstones. Is it, uh, do you know this film? You know this program? Perhaps you don't. Hands up all those who've heard, who've heard of The Flintstones. Everybody, I'm astonished. <laughs> and I thought I was out of date. Okay. Now, here's a film of a human society, maybe a million years ago, okay? And uh, it's very interesting because you've got private property, you've got money, you've got bankers, you've got policemen, you've got prisons, you've got armies, you've got judges. You've got, even got the bourgeois family where the man is oppressed by his wife, you know? Just like now. Just like that. Now, before I go any further, I must point out to you that Despite being a Marxist, we Marxists do have a sense of humour, you know. And I am, yes, I am aware that this is meant to be a comedy, it's meant to be funny. Yes, but 
People believe this. People believe this. Oh, look, you've always had private power. You've always had greed. Not true. For the great majority of the existence of the human race, there was no private property. There were still some tribes. Not many. Still some tribes in Amazon, Amazonia and so on. Where they don't know what private property is. They certainly don't know what money is. They don't know what the state is. They don't know what an army is. They don't know what a prison is. And funnily enough, they seem to get on reasonably okay. I don't, I don't want to uh, glorify this, uh, this stage of human development, but you know. What I'm saying to you is that this business about human is, is false. This I, the conception that greed motivates everything has been instilled into the human race, particularly in the last two or three hundred years under capitalism. And even then it's very skin deep. But I don't want to develop that much further. Let's go back to what I, what I said. Uh, I'm, I'm now do, moving on to historical materialism. Let's go back to, to dialectics. No, the idea that everything changes, everything's in a constant state of change, and nothing is static. And furthermore, things change into their opposites. Just get your, wrap your heads around that. Things can change into their opposites, and they do change, frequently change into their opposites. Okay, hang on a sec. You might say, well, you know, people normally, educated people at least nowadays can accept, for example, nowadays, educate, most educated people will accept the theory of evolution, yes. Of Charles, that the, that the species are not static. <coughs> that species can change one into another. That new species evolve, and so on. That our ancestors have been proven now by the Human Genome Project, which shows, and this is the final answer to all the religious nonsense, that God created the heaven and the earth and uh, created a man that was poor chap, he was quite happy, you know, in the Garden of Eden. He didn't want for anything. He was okay. And then one night, this Godfella, for some reason, best known to himself, takes a, a, rib, a rib out of this guy without an understanding, without asking his permission, and creates a woman. <laughs> and all the problems start. If you believe the Bible, it's, it's true. All the problems start from Eve giving uh, Adam this apple, which the, he was foolish enough to accept. Never accept apples from strange women, guy. You come off badly, you know. And God was very offended. At it. He was very mightily annoyed at it. I don't know why. I never worked out why he was annoyed, but he was annoyed anyway. And he kicked them out. And then they had a rough time ever since. That's one possible explanation of human history, which many people accept. To go back to what I was saying, that most educated people nowadays would accept evolution. Now, the, the human ge genome shows, by the way, that we share our genes with fruit flies. And, um, and creatures much more primitive than fruit flies. We share our, about 200 genes, I think, with, with bacteria. And even creatures more, more ancient than bacteria. That pre presents us with a map of where we've come from. Okay? That's materialism, if you like. Yes, but you see, people... Oh, when I say most educated people except uh, Darwin, not everyone though. In the United States there's a big campaign of millions, used to call themselves creationists, now they call themselves, what do they call Intelligent design. Intelligent design, that's a laugh. I mean, good God, why did God invent, invent things like pubic lice and uh, Ebola, for goodness sake? You think you'd have better things to do with this time, you know? In fact, one, one, one medieval Spanish monarch, I think it was out of Sancho el Sabio, I think Sancho the Wise, actually said, had I been present when the Almighty created the, the world, I could have given him some good advice. <laughs> Intelligent design. We leave that to one side. What I'm saying to you is, is that it's astonishing. That's, that's a dialectical contradiction. In the, the 21st century, millions of American citizens, including educated people, university students, lecturers, doctors, scientists even, support this nonsense. And want, they don't want Darwin to be taught in the schools. They want this, the first, uh, the fir or at least they want the first chapter of Genesis to be taught in the schools on an equal level to, to Darwin's thesis. I mean, that, that tells you a lot about American uh, culture and the crisis of capitalist culture in the 21st century. But to go back to what I was saying, the, uh, everyone accepts, every educated, most educated, accepts the idea of change and, and, and evolution. Yes, they accept it, but they don't understand it. 
Most people do not understand evolution for the simple reason Charles Darwin didn't understand evolution either. You know, he, he envisages e- evolution as being a slow, gradual change uninterrupted by any sudden altercations, you know. So the, the line of evolution is supposed to be like that. You know, that's wrong. Darwin himself suspected that there was something wrong. He knew there was something wrong. There was something which puzzled him which he couldn't sleep at night to the end of his days, worrying about this. It's a phenomenon which is well known to geologists called the Cambrian Explosion, a very important event, because it's the transition from the simplest forms of single-celled life in the oceans to complex, multi-celled animals. And this did not happen gradually. Okay, It happened suddenly. That's why it's called the Cambrian Explosion. He couldn't understand this, but in any case, he didn't know the mechanisms were involved. It's up to a, it was up to a modern scientist, an American paleontologist, a famous man called Stephen Jay Gould. He died about 10 years ago, unfortunately. Brilliant man. Okay. Who, by the way, was an admirer of Marx and Engels' contribution to science. He actually wrote in one of his essays, he said, I wish that scientists had paid attention to what Engels, Engels was Marx's uh, collaborator. I wish that pa- pa- scientists had paid attention to what Engels wrote a hundred years ago about human origins because we'd have saved ourselves a hundred years of mistakes. I can elaborate on that if you wish, but there isn't time. And it was Stephen Jay Gould who developed a new idea about 30 years ago called punctuated e- equilibria, which shows that the line of evolution is not a straight line like that, it's like this. Long periods of what you uh, call, call stasis, very slow accumulations of change almost imperceptible, suddenly are interrupted by catastrophes like the, the, the uh, which are characterized by the extinction of some species and the emergence of other species, e.g. the dinosaurs is the most famous one, not the most important one. So that history knows, evolution knows, both long periods of slow change, evolutionary change, you like, and also revolutions. Now, you see, Hegel understood this and Marx understood this, well, they explained the theory of the transformation of quantity into quality. That's to say, you can have long periods of... Well, let me give you the most famous example. Water. You can heat water from 0 degrees centigrade to 100 degrees centigrade. The molecules be a speed up, but it's still water. You know, you can drink it, you can make a cup of tea with it, you can have a shower in it, you know what water is. But preci- precisely at 100 degrees at normal atmospheric temperature, in case anyone objects. Precisely at 100 degrees, you get a sudden change, which, which is in modern physics is referred to as a phase transition. Phase transitions is a very important uh, aspect of modern physics. If you cool water from 100 degrees to 0 degrees, what happens? So does it first of all become a paste, and then a jelly, and then eventually becomes hot? Oh, no, no, no. It it remains water, it remains a liquid at precisely zero degrees. I understand I've never seen this done, but apparently it is possible. In the laboratory, you just give it a tap and it becomes solid. A sudden change of quantity into quality. Now, you see, there is an infinite number of examples of this. It's been developed lately by, uh, by, uh, what was that, MI5? (laughs) Tell me the other door. I'm not speaking loud enough. <coughs> Sorry, mate. That's all right. Welcome. Uh, there are, there's an infinite uh, number, uh, n- number of examples of this. Now, I must confess to you that when I was uh, your age, how I used to hate people using that expression. When I was your age, I, I thought that the dialectics was, was correct, but I never thought that it could be proven scientifically, mathematically, and expressed as a mathematical equation. Let me tell you something. It, ha- it has been. It has been. Through the development of chaos theory in the last 20 or 30 years, and the, de- the, the derivatives of uh, chaos, <coughs> chaos theory, it's been demonstrated. For example, there's a theory, the theory of ubiquity. There's a book which I recommend by an American, not a Marxist, 
An American scientist called Mark Buchanan. Maybe out of print. You might get it on the internet. It's called ubiquity. What does ubiquity mean? Anyone know Latin here? They don't teach Latin anymore. What's ubique mean in Latin? You don't know? No Latin scholars? No classical scholars? Everywhere. Correct. Go to the top of the class. <laughs> ubique means everywhere. Ubiquity means everywhere. And this book, uh, this, this uh, theory shows that the same process, that, what I'm describing, quantity and equality, is, is present in things as, as different as a heart attack, heart attacks, forest fires, the rise and fall of animal populations, the movement of traffic in, in cities, wars, stock exchange crises, I would add revolutions, it's the same thing, uh, and even things like uh, changes in, in, in fashion, and, and schools of art, I mean, this is astonishing, can be expressed as what is known as a power law, which is a type of equation. Now, I'm very poor at maths, so I wouldn't like to go into the details. But this is so. In other words, what, what we're describing is, the, why am I saying this to you? Let's go back to this earthquake analogy. In Britain, you look around and you, th- and you say, well, nothing's changing here. It's hopeless. Why are you talking about revolution? People don't understand revolution in Britain. Or, and so on. Now we have some Greek comrades here. You know. I know Greek, Greece pretty well. I was going back and forth to Greece for political purposes about 20 years. I speak a little bit of Greek. I know the country very well. Okay? And I'll tell you something. Five or six years ago, Greece was a normal, prosperous European country, not much different from Britain. Am I right? Am I right? Sustor? Symphonies? Okay? Prosperous, everyone was happy. And I'm sure if I went to Athens uh, five or six years ago and I started to talk about socialist revolution, people would they'd probably be too, 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 too polite to say anything nasty, but they'd say, this man from London is not quite right in the head, you know. And then he'd smile and uh, offer me a glass of ouzo and then we'd forget about it. <laughs> I'll tell you something. I guarantee, and I'm, I challenge the Greek communist president, I can go to Athens tomorrow morning and go to anyone, never mind about workers and students, I can go to any taxi driver, any small shopkeeper, and I say, what we need in Greece is a revolution, and he would agree. Yes, certainly. There's even a, an opinion poll which demonstrated that. The reason is, in Greece now, the, the whole thing has collapsed. With the, because of the crisis of capitalism, you have schools without books, you have hospitals without drugs, You have chemist shops without medicines. You have a massive unemployment. Out of every three Greek uh, young people, two are unemployed with no prospect of getting any employment. That's the change. There have been more than 30 general strikes in Greece in the last four years, four or five years. A sudden change has taken place. And you can see the beginnings of this change everywhere because people are beginning to realize things which they didn't realize before, even in the United States of America. You are the Occupy movement. All right, then. I, what am I saying here? I'm not saying that. Am I saying that uh, next Monday the red flag will be flying from the White House and they'll be declaring the Soviet Republic of the United States? I don't think so. Not yet. Not yet. Give them, t- give them a little time. What I am saying is that there is, I was in the States last year, I'm telling you, there is a, 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 a change taking place, there is a questioning of this society, of capitalism, of the bankers and so on, and all that, which was not there before. Okay? And that's everywhere the same. You see the beginnings of revolutionary movements in Tunisia, in Egypt, although that's not uh, resolved. But certainly, the, uh, it's an astonishing step. Well, last year, 18 months ago, 17 million people hit the streets of Egypt and overthrew the Morsi government. Good God, there weren't 17 million on the, on the, in the streets in, in Russia in 1917. In Greece, you've had these colossal... In Spain, you've had the colossal movements. The development of Podemos is a very important... Even, in, even the, the, what happened in Scotland, I don't believe that that vote was a, was a nationalist vote. I don't believe it. Uh, some people would have been affected by that. But basically, it's a reflection of, of a profound discontent with the existing state of affairs with the unemployment, with the poverty, with the bankers' bonuses, and above all with this political elite who don't express in any sense, shape or form the anger which exists. Let's go back to the geology. 
Beneath the surface, and let's use a social analogy, beneath the surface of apparent calm, yes, things were calm in Scotland not long ago, were they not? They were so complacent, these, these uh, gentlemen in Westminster. They weren't even worried about the referendum until, until finally they felt the water reaching, the, reaching their neck. And what occurred? They, they still can't understand what happened in Scotland. Everything was calm, everything was peaceful, everyone supported the Union. Yeah, what happened is this. Beneath the surface, and that goes for everywhere, it goes for Britain, it goes for Wales, it goes for England, it goes for France, it goes for any country. You can look at Hong Kong now. Isn't that a sudden development? Everything was calm and peaceful in Hong Kong not long ago, was it not? A revolution in Hong Kong? What are you talking about? The centre of the world's banking uh, fraternity, uh, prosperity, order, peace? Yes. I repeat, dialectics teaches us things change into the opposite. Okay? And this is the same thing with, with the, the, the geology, with the, an earthquake. Beneath the surface of apparent tranquility and calm and order and stability, there's a seething discontent. You better believe it. I think people know this, really. There's a seething discontent. Anger, rage, a feeling of injustice, of indignation. Okay? And above all, of frustration. Why? Because there's no particular large party, anyway, or even trade union, unfortunately, which is adequately reflecting this. That explains what occurred in Scotland. There's no mystery to me. And that is going to occur again and again and again. But you see, there's something missing, and I'll finish on this. There's something missing. What's missing? What was missing in Egypt 18 months ago? Power was in the hands of the people. Power was lying in the streets. Army could do nothing. 17 million people. Here. Something was missing. And that something was the necessary organization and party and leadership. That's, that's what was missing. What was present in Russia in 1917 was absent. And that's a constant feature now. And therefore our task as Marxists, I would argue, is to begin to create this phenomenon. To begin to create the necessary organization, alternatives, with clear ideas, and explain this to people, starting with the students, you know, the young people are very open to these ideas. Also the advanced workers are very open, as you'll find. But we need to get organized. That's the tr trouble, isn't it? Our enemies are organized. And how? With the might of the state, the press, the television, the church, the universities. It's all part of the establishment. They're very well organized, okay? To defend the status quo. Our problem is that we are not organized or not, not organized sufficiently. And I'll just finish on this uh, striking idea. What are we aiming at? What is our aim? Well, it's a very modest aim. We're not uh, extremists. It's a very modest aim. We, we only want to turn the world upside down. That's all. And you look around the room and say, yes, but there's so few of us. So few of us. Let me tell you something. Every revolutionary movement in history always started with small numbers. How could it be otherwise? Always started as a small minority. Jesus Christ started with 12. <laughs> and one of those was no good. <laughs> you know. But that didn't stop them from, uh, from shaking the Roman Empire to the roots. And therefore what I'll say is this. That uh, for many years, it's true that we've been isolated, we've been thrown back. So that's true. That we've been in a minority fighting against the stream. Okay. It's been very difficult. But now I think that the tide of history is turning. It is not true that uh, capitalism has always existed. It's not true. Capitalism has only existed for the last two or three hundred years, as a matter of fact. Prior to that, there was feudalism, which rose and fell. Prior to that, there was slave society, which rose and fell. You know, societies are like human beings. They are born, they develop, they thrive, then they reach a point where they can't develop the means of progress any further, and they enter into decline. And at that stage, what is necessary, what we're seeing now, I'll finish on this, what we're seeing, all these horrors, because there are horrors. Lenin said, capitalism is horror without end. Just look at the world you live in. Anywhere you care to look. Horror without... Five million people were slaughtered in the Congo. They don't, talk about, they don't even talk about that. They don't even talk about it. It didn't, didn't, make, didn't make the headlines. Horror without end. Ebola, all that. Quite unnecessary. They could solve the Ebola like that 
if they put the necessary resources, which, which exist. I'm not talking about utopia, my friends. All the objective, scientific, economic means exist already for transforming society. The problem is, not that we don't technically, that we can't solve these problems, but that everything in the system is subordinated to one thing alone, and that's the profits of a tiny, a really a tiny group of families and individuals. That is what has got to be solved. That has got to be dealt with. And I believe that more and more people understand this. With our assistance, with your assistance, we can make them understand a lot faster. But the prior condition is to, to organize. Let me just finish with one idea. The working class, which is supposed not to exist. I spoke at a meeting in Quebec, in Quebec University, speaking bad French a couple of years ago. And this clever, well, there's so many clever dicks in the university. Really. He said, oh, the working class doesn't exist anymore. And there was a worker in the audience, a common who stood up and said, hey, he said, I'm fed up of coming to meetings and being told by people like you that I don't exist. <laughs> okay? And I said, well, look, the light is on. Why, why is the light working? You think, is it an act of God? You know? Think about it. In any society, in Britain or whatever, any other country, any other country, not a wheel turns, not a telephone rings, not a light bulb shines without the kind permission of the working class. Think about it. That's a colossal power. The trouble is the workers have this power. They don't know that they have this power. That's the trouble. And therefore this has got to be explained. One final natural analogy. You see, steam is also a power. Steam is the basis of the Industrial Revolution. We wouldn't be here without steam. Yes, but steam is only a power when it's centralized and organized and concentrated in one point, which I believe is called a piston box. Okay? Without that necessary mechanism, the steam just evaporates in the air. It's the same thing with the power of the working class, the power of the masses. It can only be a real power when it is organized properly for the change in the society. And therefore, our task is that. First of all, you've got to get organized. We've got to get organized. Discuss these ideas. <coughs> Develop yourselves politically to the level posed by history, and then we'd, we'd be in a position to provide the necessary organization and leadership that's necessary to change society in Britain, in Europe, and throughout the world. Was correct. Why hasn't there been a revolution so far? Uh, by the way, Marx and Engels, Engels at the end of his life wrote the following. He said, Marx and I were in a minority all our lives, and we were proud to be in a minority. The bottom line is, and think, think, think about this carefully, the bottom line is, do we or do we not accept this monstrosity of capitalism? Do we accept that the world, this society and the world will, or not? If you accept, well, I think there's nothing more. To, there's nothing to talk about. If you don't accept, you have a bounden duty to fight against the system. But in order to fight, you've got to fight effectively. That means you've got to organize and understand uh, what, what you're doing. Why hasn't it taken place so far? It's a good question that uh, Jake asked. I would say fundamentally, you have, to, uh, you have to find the answer to that question in the objective conditions of society. fact of the matter is, since I was involved, since 1960, everything that we said uh, didn't appear to make sense as far as ordinary people, working, even working people were concerned. Capitalism was deliver the, de delivering the goods. Let me give you a case in the point. When I left school in the early, early 1960s, there was no unemployment in Great Britain. None. The only time that someone was out of work is when you're changing jobs. You leave university and you could choose the jobs. That you were. By the way, I'm from a poor working class family. Okay? I didn't pay anything to go to university. I got paid a living wage. What's the position now? Now we have a position where most working class families can't afford to send their children to university. That avenue is being blocked. 
And everywhere, all of the, the conditions. So by the way, all these marvelous reforms, none of them were ever given to the working class. They had to be fought for every inch of the way. Even democracy had to be fought for every inch of the way. Votes, votes for women, women's rights. Everything had to be fought for. Now they're take, trying to take everything back. That, by the way, is a finished recipe for class struggle everywhere. But the, the, the long and short of it, to answer Jay's question, is we were in a, in a minority always because our ideas didn't seem to fit with reality, where things were not too bad. Workers, I mean, workers, let's face fact, no, nobody wants revolutions and barricades and fighting in the streets. Who want you going to be crazy? If, you can, if there can be an alternative way out, people will take it, even if it means working overtime, or killing yourselves, working, taking out credit, whatever. But all of those avenues are blocked. There is no overtime. There is no work. The banks collapsed in 2008. And all they need of credit, and so that's finished. There's no question of credit now. You, tr- you just try it. There's no credit now. And therefore, the only alternative, I would say, is to fight. And, and therefore, you've got to fight consciously. That's what I'm saying. Now, what, what, are, what are we saying? What, what are we aiming for? We're not just nihilists. We're not just saying, destroy it. On the contrary. Look, I take my cap off to the capitalist system. I'm very grateful to the capitalist system. They've, they've, built, they've done miracles. They've built modern industry, modern agriculture. Yes, but they're like the sorcerer's apprentice. They've built all these things and they can't use them. The tragedy, the dilemma of the 21st century is we have in our hands all the technological means to build a better... For example, why is it that 8 million people, children mainly die every year from diarrhoea? Because they have no access to, to clean water. Don't tell me that there's no, not the technical means to solve this problem. Even Ebola could be solved like that. The means are there. All the technological means of the, the wonders of science. You could put a man on the moon. They're talking about putting a man on Mars. Not a bad idea. They should start with, uh, with uh, Cameron and the Craig. And perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps they can find room for Milliband as well. It's, uh, we have all the means. And yet on, on Earth people live, millions of people live in poverty. Not just in Africa and in the Middle East and so on. But in our own country. People living in the streets. People without houses and so on and so forth. And therefore, what, what I'm saying is that the, the, the solution is not utopian, it's possible. And somebody mentioned this, I think it was you mentioned it. it, it you know, it's, I, I, I'm not very bright about things like that, but it always, I'm always surprised, whenever I go to, you imagine Tesco, I'm a Tesco person myself, in a hell of a mess now, never mind. Uh, I'm, I'm astonished. You've got this supermarket, and, and they know exactly how many loaves of bread are required, how, many, how much milk, how much meat, and so for the whole area. They plan it. There's no anarchy there. There's no chaos there. Inside is perfectly planned. Now, if that can be done within a supermarket, why can it the same thing not be done in the whole of society? Is it beyond our intelligence? Is the human race so stupid that we can't own and control the means of production such that there's no unemployment and everyone can be put to work and, uh, and therefore... The, the means of developing society can be developed. Instead of cutting back and cutting back, you know, as, as they are doing at, at the moment. I say no. I say it's perfectly feasible. And by the way, it, 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 it must be democratic. Socialism must be democratic. It's capitalism that's not democratic. Where's the democracy? You can vote for who the hell you like. You vote for the same in Portugal. That's why people are skeptical. Vote for whoever you like. Who decides... I'll tell you, who decides is the board, unelected boards of directors, tiny handfuls of people, of the banks. You see, let, let me prove the point. You know. Why are there so many cuts? Austerity, you know, they, they talk about austerity for the foreseeable future, for the next 20 years. Why? Ah, there's no money, my friends. Cameron comes in, my heart bleeds for you, you know. I'm so sorry. You know, he said, but you must understand, you've got to be practical. And then Milliband comes up, me too, me too, I'm practical, let's cut the benefits. Okay, cut, cut, cut. Why? You understand, there's a deficit. What they never ask is, why is there a deficit? You know, you ought to know why there's a deficit. 2008, the banks collapsed as a result of speculating, swindling on a massive scale. They, they, they wrecked the whole damn 
system, okay? Now, you know the argument? Oh, capitalism works. I think somebody mentioned that. Oh, yes, democratic. Uh, uh, we, we run risks. We, we've got to earn a profit because we, we take risks, you know? My friends, where's the risk? For goodness sake, come on, wake up. Where's the risk? The banks collapsed because of their mismanagement in 2008, okay? What did they do? Did they say, oh, no, we stand on our own two feet, like they say to the unemployed? And to the poor and to the old and the sick, stand on your own two feet. And Scotland, stand on your own two feet. Don't ask us for money. State must stay out anyway. State has got no role in the economy. You know this argument? <coughs> Private enterprise, risks taking. When the banks collapsed in 2000, what did they do? Did they say, oh yes, we bankers will stand on their own two feet like hell. They came running to the state, which is not supposed to play any role in the economy. And George W. Bush... A Republican, can you imagine? Comes running with an open checkbook. Here's a man that doesn't believe in the state participating. Government mustn't participate. Open. How much do you want, guys? A billion, take a billion. Ten billion, take, ten, take a trillion. And they say, and George Gordon Brown, the so-called Labour man, Gordon Brown did the same thing in Britain. They handed over billions to the bankers for the privilege of wrecking the world's financial system. Okay. That is why there's a deficit. There's only one slight problem, you see. Oh, we saved the whole situation. Yes, you, you saved the bloody banks. That's what you saved. Okay. Now then, only when there's a pro- Can you not see there's a little problem here? No? Let me spell it out. The state has not got any money. The state has not got a beam. Okay. So then all, of the, all they did in the last five or six years is to transfer what was a colossal black hole in the banks into the private banks, into a colossal black hole of the public finances. They then turn around and say, oh, my friends, I'm very sorry, you know, no money for pensions, no money for, for universities, students got to pay their way, we've all got to suffer, we've all got to, yeah, all, all of us, really, all of us? Yeah, I didn't see any bankers suffering lately. I didn't see them being put in jail or put on trial for their crimes, because it was a crime. I didn't even see them get sacked. On the contrary, they, they, they're laughing all the way to the back, except that they haven't got far to walk, have they? <laughs> you know. I mean, what, what my friend from school, I'm so delighted to see a, friends, a fellow Swansea man. We'll see you in the pub afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I'll buy a pint, there you are. From Brynhavrid and all that club. Now then, what was I talking about? You interrupted me, no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it, 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 as as, as uh, Chris correctly said, it's not, once you explain this in clear, simple language, it's not difficult. People are not so stupid. People can see, and people are outraged by this. They're outraged by it. And this indignation is not being reflected by anybody in any of the existence. That's why people, the same in Portugal, that's why people are. In Portugal, there's been austerity cuts after, brutal, worse than in Britain, much worse than Britain. Cuts after cuts. They were all responsible. The sources were responsible. The right wing is responsible. Brussels is dictated. What's the result in Portugal? You've you got know, the, the, the That's right. You've got the, you've got the, you've got the yes, and the, the, the agents in Lisbon. But you've got the bigger, you've still got a huge deficit. Same in Ireland, same everywhere. Nothing's been solved. And therefore, it's like Robin Hood in reverse, isn't it? You know? <laughs> Robin Hood used to rob the rich to, to give to the poor. Now they're robbing the poor to give to the rich. Now, I don't think this is right. You know, you, you will excuse me, okay? But what's to be done about it? Now, some people despair and they say, no, I can understand the scepticism, not only in Portugal, <coughs> this colossal scepticism in Britain. In Scotland, it, I, don't, I still don't think that there was really a nationalist movement. It was an expression of this same indignation. We, we're fed up with these posh guys in London telling us what to do with their posh accent, which was with the same effect, same in Swans, the same effect as, as a dentist drill. <laughs> people, you know, it's a horrible bloody accent, anyway. <laughs> you know. And uh, people are, f- people are all, uh, most people are fuming about this, but nobody's expressing this. The national, uh, Salmon and the Nationals were quite smart, and they played the left image. They're not left wing, this is a capitalist party. If he'd have been elected, the, the Scottish people would have had a rude, rude awakening the very next day. But he played the gun. People are fed up. And that's a general thing. It's not, I agree with Chris. It's not difficult, my friends. But it, what we have to a task to do this. Now, scepticism. Well, I can understand uh, scepticism. But it doesn't lead anywhere, you see. So, so when it's sceptical, so what, you, what conclusion are you supposed to draw from that? Go back to bed. 
Let me tell you something. I've come across this in, in, in many meetings. I've come to some says, oh, no, no. What you say is all very interesting, but I, I, I don't believe in, in politics and so on. Well, you know, you might not be interested in politics. I'm not referring to... Uh, what was he interested in, Maria? Rita. Rita, there we are. You know my wife is related to Amalia Rodriguez? <laughs> really? Yes, really. <laughs> there we are, see? Wow. Ah, wow. Yeah, she was... Anyway, that's not about it. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, what am I talking about now? Skepticism. Pardon? Skepticism. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I'm not interested in politics. My answer is very simple. My friend, you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. You think you can escape from politics? Just you try it. Run to your house, lock the door, lock the windows, hide under the bed, put the, pill, the blanket over your head, and I'll tell you, politics one day will come to your house and knock on the door usually in a very inconvenient hour. You can't escape from this. And therefore, the, the question is, I, either, you, either you will fight or they'll trample all over you. You know what you people are? Shall I tell you? You're the best qualified unemployed people in the history of Britain. That's how, things, that's, that's how things are. And therefore, it's a very clear alternative that one faces. Either you fight this system... Or else they will trample all over you. And you will deserve it. Let me spell it bluntly. So the question is, fight, yes, but how do you fight? You must fight properly, adequately. First of all, with the adequate ideas, which I maintain, are the ideas of Marxism. Secondly, you, you definitely have to organise. We have to get organised. Now, are there dangers in this? Well, there's dangers, you know, if you cross the road. You know, there's dangers if you get up in the morning. There was an old song years ago... Oh, it's nice to get up in the morning, but it's safer to stay in bed. I suppose it's true. No, no. Of course, there's risks in everything. There's risks, of course, you might be defeated, this might happen, that might happen. But one thing is certain, you don't know that. You don't know the outcome of a struggle until you enter into it. One thing you can be sure of, if you don't fight, then, of course, the outlook is grim. Extremely grim. And the alternative is, it, it would be so easy, you see. What we're saying is that people, not, not be wrong, as, as, as Ben said, we're not advocating what they had in the Soviet Union, although the Russian Revolution was a very great emancipatory movement, but it became isolated under conditions of backwardness and degenerated on, along bureaucratic lines. We don't advocate that. What failed in the Soviet Union was not socialism in any sense that Marx or Lenin would have understood, but in any event, what failed was a bureaucratic and totalitarian caricature <laughs> of sorts, and that certainly failed and it deserved to fail but we're not, what we're saying is the opposite socialism must be democratic Pe what we're saying is that pe the people themselves the workers themselves can, can run industry better than the capitalists, I've got plenty of proof of this I participated for some years in, in Venezuela, in the Venezuelan revolution I've seen workers control working working people are very uh, are not stupid actually they're quite uh, equipped to run industry, with the assistance of course of people who were, somebody asked, well will it be intellectuals, will it be people who, well, put it this way the, the, if we, as Marx said so, the, the emancipation of the working class is the task of the working class itself, and I believe that, I got every confidence in, in our class, however does that mean to say that students or intellectuals are not welcome, have no role to play, on the contrary, they can have a very big role to play on condition that they are, that they are modest and not uh, Arrogant, as unfortunately some students have come across to be a bit arrogant, which is wrong. I'll give you a case in point. I was speaking to a meeting of workers control. Workers had taken over a factory in Venezuela. And, and I was explaining these things. That they, were, they agreed that they were quite capable of running the factory themselves. And uh, there was a guy standing by the door. Um, he seemed very timid and so on. I said, come in, come in, don't stand there. Come in. It turns out he was a manager. He said, but I'm a manager. It doesn't matter. Come in, come in. We could deal with this. We, we need skilled managers and so on, and engineers. You can play a role. Of course, and under the control of the workers, that's the point. You, but your expertise is very welcome, and you do participate. You see, we, 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 should, we should use all the expertise of society in order to run society in the interest of the majority, not of the minority. Is this utopian? I don't see it. Why on earth should it be utopian? There's nothing utopian about it. Is there a danger that there might be some degeneration like in Russia? People, can, Well, there's always a, a risk. But, you know, Le Lenin had the answer to that. He put forward the following program, you know. 
for the first day after the Socialist Revolution. And the program was this. Free and democratic elections to all the positions in the Soviet state. With right of recall, that's to say, I elect you to represent me. You don't do what you promised, you're out. With the, with the least possible uh, formality. Right of recall doesn't exist. I wish to press you right of recall in Britain. Secondly, no official must receive a higher wage than a skilled worker. That's an anti-bureaucratic uh, thing. Thirdly, no standing army or police force but the armed people, workers' militia. And fourthly, very important, gradually all, of, all the workers, all the people should be involved in running the state themselves, such that the state as a coercive instrument would cease to disappear, would disappear and be replaced by the administrative the administration of things. Now that wasn't possible in Russia because of the extreme backwardness, terrible uh, conditions of poverty and backwardness. Six million people starved to death in Russia in 1920. That's no basis for socialism. Socialism must have a certain base in the development of culture, e economy, and so on and so forth. Anyway, that's, that's what, what, what I believe in. Nationalism, by the way, cannibalism, nobody questions that seriously. You speak to any anthropologist. I'm, just, I'm an archaeology. Well, you, you'll sorry, find plenty of evidence in archaeology of, of things, people that have been butchered and so on. But why not? It's logical. There wasn't much meat at all. Oh, no, I know. I, like, I'm sure that that's true in a lot of old societies. Yes. I was just wondering where you got the statistic that, like, or where well, you got the information that all societies Well, as you say, it, it's, it's not... I feel like that's yeah. kind of it. Like, have you looked at every single society in the universe? Well, I, I must confess that I've not looked at every, every society in, Sorry, in, can I just in the world. Know, well, well, people were. But anyway, we can, dis we can discuss. You ask, ask your professor and see what he says. I think he'll agree with what I say. From a philosophical standpoint, I feel like it's kind of hard for us to make such a concrete uh, statement about Well, past it's, it, like I say, it, it is generally accepted. Ask your professor, see what he says. Okay. Come back to me, I'd be interested in his comments. But in any case, to, to come back to what I was uh, saying, we're, we're not advocating cannibalism. Oh, yeah, cannibalism yeah. exists. Uh, this is cannibalism we're living under. Now, so what, what, what was I saying? So that, this is the, the, to me it's a simple qu question. Either you accept this barbarous cannibalism, that's what it is, at the, or you fight against it. It's very simple. There is no, no other option <coughs> except passivity, and passivity and apathy leads nowhere except for the prolonged years. That's what they want. They want people to be apathetic and, uh, and, uh, and, and passive. But I, I believe that it is possible to reach people now and to explain these ideas. I'm fair run, 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 run time. Einstein says that time is relative. It's not my experience. Time is definitely absolute as far as we are concerned. So where, where, does, where does this leave us? Well, this is the beginning of a discussion. I've only just kind of skated over the basis of, uh, of Marxism. We must deepen. I would advise you to read as much as you can, discuss, read critically. But I think at the end of the day, what you will find, I'll put it this way, you will not find any better explanation or superior program of action to what is put forward by Marxism. And that is surely something that's worth developing and fighting for. And convincing other people. I mean, this what this room? How many does it hold? There's about fifty, I suppose, in, in total. <coughs> yes, but if, if all of you, you carry the, this message to other people, to your friends and fellow students, build the source, build the Marxist society, build the Marxist federation. Well, that's an important start. Yes, and above all, link the student movement to the working class, which is the only class that could really change society. If you do that. Look, finally, I'm not promising anything easy here. You know, anything that's worthwhile in, in, in life tends to be difficult. There are no easy options. What I'm promising you is a hard fight. But if you don't conduct this fight, then, of course, the outlook for the human race will be quite, uh, quite serious, quite grim as a matter of fact. I don't believe that for a moment. I've got every confidence in humanity, in the future of humanity, the future of the working class, and the future of the youth, the young Marxists, who are destined to play a very important role in the struggle, which now begins to unfold.